When I was a child, the character of Clayface scared the crap out of me. Imagine youngster me sitting down eating my breakfast one Saturday morning to watch a disfigured actor be force-fed a vat of mutagenic formula and dumped in an alleyway. I was absolutely horrified by that episode, and to be honest, it still bothers me a little bit today. In fact, there were times when capturing footage for this video where I had to look away from the screen for a minute. Like most people, things that bother me tend to linger in my thoughts, and there's scarcely a day that goes by where I don't at least briefly think about the plight of Matt Hagen in the DC Animated Universe. The first video essay I made on this channel was about the influence of classic Hollywood on the BTAS version of Clayface, and that video got a pretty good reaction from many of you, especially after I identified the influence of movie star and tragic queer icon Montgomery Clift on the character. I've received a few comments asking me to make a follow-up video looking at the queerness of Clayface, and I'm more than willing to take a stab at this, but keep in mind I'm not an expert. I wrote this intro after making all of my notes on the episodes in question, and I just want to give you a heads up that this is not going to be a light-hearted video, and I will be discussing some heavy topics. Although, frankly, if you know anything about the Clayface episodes of BTAS, then you probably wouldn't expect me to be talking about Sunshine and Roses. To make this simple, I'm going to work my way through the three Clayface stories in Batman the Animated Series. Feet of Clay, Parts 1 and 2, Mudslide, and Growing Pains. I'm going to assume that if you're watching this video, then you're already very familiar with these episodes. So I'll try to focus on individual scenes and what they mean, rather than recounting the entire events of each episode. So let's get going with Feet of Clay. So right off the bat, we've previously established that Matt Hagen was intended to be in a relationship with his stand-in, Teddy Lupus. This is, this ham actor is, a, this is someone that you've, you've met. You know, that's someone that we all know, and it, that's why it's so effective. Yeah, that's like, and it's, yeah, and it's like, it's, it's a tragic end, but then again, only for, uh, well, God, what's his name? Only for his, uh, oh, his boyfriend? Yeah. His boyfriend. And that was, that was intentionally a gay relationship, too. Teddy is, as far as we know, the only person that knew Hagen's secret. And there's something really telling about Hagen being in a relationship with someone that is supposed to fill in for him while the cameras are being set up. Essentially, he's in a relationship with another version of himself. In fact, this whole scene that introduces us to Matt Hagen is incredibly psychologically revealing. Hagen's dressing room is adorned with newspaper clippings about his disfiguring accident, complete with possible photos of his injury. While this serves as environmental storytelling, letting us, the audience, know about Hagen's horrific injury, it also tells us that Hagen wallows in his own despair, constantly reminding himself of the worst day of his life. He lashes out verbally at Teddy, insulting him at every opportunity. And if we follow the chain of thought that Teddy is a stand-in for Matt, Hagen is indirectly berating himself. So frustrated is he with his current situation in life that these angry outbursts are the only way he can get any sense of control of his situation. There's just so much anger and self-loathing in this scene, but at the same time, Hagen is clearly a very vain person whose role as an actor is thoroughly ingrained into his identity. Hagen is willing to do awful things to hold on to his life, no matter how much he hates it. One thing that I don't think enough people acknowledge is that when we first meet Hagen, he is already Clayface. He can mould his face for up to 24 hours with each dose of Renew You. And Teddy attributes Hagen's abusive behaviour to his addiction. Hagen has clearly been using this substance for quite some time, as Teddy points out that many of Hagen's best films were made after his accident. However, when his supply is cut off after failing to kill Lucius Fox, Hagen decides to break into Dagger Industries and steal a large quantity of it, which, as any sensible person might guess, does not go well at all. The opening section of this scene is presented from Hagen's perspective as he walks through the halls of Daggett's research lab. This directly places the viewer in the position of Hagen, even though it quickly switches back to a third-person perspective, almost like you're having an out-of-body experience. Now, in this scene, Hagen is brutally violated in one of the most cruel and sadistic scenes in the entire DC Animated Universe. He's pinned down, unable to defend himself, and has the Renew You formula poured down his throat. This was an unplanned, opportunistic attack perpetrated by Raymond Bell and Germs, Daggett's henchmen. 
Bell and Germs were told to kill Hagen by Daggett. Instead, the sadistic Bell impulsively decided to exert his power over Hagen and Germs went along with it. You can tell that this is a spontaneous act because Bell and Germs didn't actually have a plan for disposing of Hagen's body. They just dumped his melting corpse in his own car behind Daggett Industries. If Hagen had died, then the police would have easily been able to identify him from his driver's license and wouldn't have to go very far to find the culprits. Everything that Matt Hagen ever was drips away following this assault, leaving only his new form later dubbed Clayface. Adding to the tragedy, Teddy stumbles upon Clayface after desperately driving around in a taxi and takes Clayface back to the movie studios. When Clayface is back in his trailer, he sits in the darkness looking in the mirror as Teddy packs up their belongings. Where they're going or what they plan on doing is never disclosed because Clayface soon realises that he is temporarily able to pull himself together and look the way he used to. Until Teddy unexpectedly embraces him, breaking his concentration and returning him to his Clayface form. That sudden unexpected physical contact causes him to break his concentration and the look of shock on his face. He cannot pretend to be okay and this causes him to fly into a fit of rage. Now, anger is a secondary emotion. It's something that is expressed as a result of another underlying emotion. In this case, it could be any number of negative emotions. Embarrassment, shame, despair, helplessness, disappointment. By violently lashing out, Clayface is trying to regain some form of control of the situation. He cannot undo what has been done to him, but his fury and his acts of violence are how he handles his trauma. This scene ends with a powerful line that gives us a great insight into Clayface's character. I'm not an actor anymore. I'm not even a man. <laughs> you can take that statement at face value. He no longer believes himself to be human, and I'm sure that was the writer's intention. But I think that this statement has a much deeper meaning. He could be lamenting the loss of his physical form, specifically his genitals, the thing that makes him a man. But I think it's just as likely that he has complex feelings about being unable to defend himself. The stereotypical man is supposed to be big and tough. They're not supposed to be victimised. Of course, we know that most stereotypes are bogus. He's angry at himself for not being strong enough to fight off germs and bell. He's angry at himself for being dependent on Renew You. He's angry at himself for being in an accident that disfigured him in the first place. But his anger is rarely directed at himself. Instead, he yells at Teddy and breaks inanimate objects. In the book Batman Animated, written by Paul Dini, Paul describes Clayface as, Clayface was a soul who fell victim to sin, in his case vanity, and became a poetically ironic caricature of his baser nature. He can regain the illusion of his lost humanity for a time, but it's only skin deep. His inner self is now as ugly and distorted as his exterior, and it eventually comes through in whatever form he wears. After escaping a confrontation with Batman, Clayface comes to realise that he no longer needs Teddy and literally throws him away, storming off into the night. This is the last time that Teddy will see Clayface. Now, this may seem like a, a facile statement, but thanks to his new abilities, Clayface seems quite comfortable presenting as both male and female. First, he turns into a male doctor, then he turns into a burly security guard. Then he appears as an older woman in the audience of Gotham Tonight. Finally, he appears as an attractive woman on the street. So he seems comfortable being any gender, really. Does Clayface even have a gender anymore? He was once a man, but what is he now? Does this make him gender fluid? Answers in the comments, please, because I really don't know the answer to that question. Later on, when Clayface's revenge is foiled by Batman, Clayface recreates his abuse when he attacks Batman, smothering him in his clay flesh. The act makes him feel powerful and brings him great joy. Just look at the smile on his face as Batman struggles to breathe, as he's submerged in the clay. Now, some studies report that up to a third of abuse victims go on to becoming abusers themselves, and I think that Clayface definitely falls into this camp. After faking his death, Clayface watches on as Teddy mourns the apparent death of his lover. As he is not next of kin, and homosexual relationships often weren't recognised by hospital administrators in those days, Teddy would not have been able to collect the body. All he could do is say goodbye from a distance and walk away. Seeing that he has fooled everyone, including Teddy, brings Clayface great joy. He revels in deceiving people, even those closest to him. And with that, he disappears. Where he went and what he did, nobody knows. But he does eventually return in... Mudslide. The premise of this episode is that Clayface has re-emerged and is struggling to maintain his physical form. 
He teams up with a doctor who worked as a consultant on some of his old movies, and she provided him with an expensive treatment for his condition. This forces Clayface to commit robberies to fund said treatment. Now, if you view Clayface as a homosexual, or potentially bisexual, based on his affections towards Stella, the Doctor, and remember that this show was written in the early 90s, it's hard not to view his condition as an analogy for the HIV-AIDS virus. Now, as noted in Kevin Conroy's biographical comic Finding Batman, AIDS tore through the New York theatre scene in the 80s and 90s, killing off a huge swathe of actors, directors, and associated crew. At the time, treatment was limited and expensive. Couple this with the fact that America doesn't have any socialised medicine to help take care of medical costs, and you can see why so many people died. As an aside, writer Grant Morrison likened the third clayface, Preston Payne, who was also unable to maintain his physical form, to a walking sexually transmitted disease in the seminal graphic novel Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth, noting in the script that alert readers will perceive him as AIDS on legs. Now, I'm not quite sure I'd go as far as labelling the BTAS version of Clayface as a walking STD, but Clayface's condition is a disease that was inflicted upon him, and given the popularity of the Arkham Asylum graphic novel, I don't think it's an unfair assumption to make that the authors of this episode would be aware of this characterization of Clayface. Anyway, let's talk about Clayface's new accomplice, Dr. Stella Bates. It's true that she is clearly in love with him, and he does seem to hold some affection for her, but ultimately Stella is in love with her idea of who Matt Hagen was, the actor on her TV screen, not the monstrous reality of Clayface. To Clayface, Stella is someone he can use to help further his aims, and once achieved, he would likely throw her aside as he did Teddy in Feet of Clay. The treatment that Stella gives Clayface involves a literal press that seals him inside of a suit to help him maintain his form. Much has been made of the fact that it makes Clayface resemble an Oscar, which is very deliberate. He was a movie star, right? However, less has been said about the fact that Stella's press moulds Clayface into the form of a more idealised male, almost as if she was forcing him to the shape of heteronormativity in order to make him love her. Of course, Clayface can't live like this and expresses frustration with being confined to the suit and living off of chemicals. He's unable to live as himself, and describes the situation as a nightmare. When Stella discovers the potential of the MP40 isotope, it's clear that this would not revert Clayface to Matt Hagen. If that's what it could do, then that little weepy lump of clay flesh would have turned back to human flesh when Stella inserted the isotope. Instead, it will allow Clayface to have his proverbial cake and eat it. He'll look like Matt Hagen while also having enhanced powers. When Batman eventually foils Stella's attempt at administering the MP40, Hagen responds once again with rage, bursting out of his containment suit and pulling Batman into him in an attempt to suffocate him. The fantasy of becoming Matt Hagen again is out the window and, once again, Clayface defaults to recreating the assault that led to his creation, smothering Batman. In one of the most shocking images from the entire episode, Batman desperately tries to free himself from Clayface's body, but he's unable to. Clayface takes great delight in feeling Batman's pulse slowing to a stop. When Batman eventually escapes from Clayface's body by launching his grapple gun through Clayface's head, ouch, Clayface lashes out in anger, destroying the machinery that had been keeping him alive. Once again, his anger has got the better of him, and it is ultimately responsible for his demise. Deep down inside, he would rather die than continue to live a lie. There was no possibility of Clayface ever surviving that life with Stella, hence why he forces Batman outside to battle in the rain, despite Stella's pleas, knowing it would hasten his demise. He lunges at Batman, causing the two of them to tumble over the cliff's edge. Despite a last moment attempt at saving himself, Clayface is unable to hold on and tumbles into the ocean. His lifeless body floats to the surface and dissolves. And that is the last time we see Clayface. At least until the new Batman adventures. We learn in the episode Growing Pains that Clayface was able to survive his watery end thanks to strange chemicals being pumped into the ocean by a waste pipe at a coastal chemical plant. These chemicals allowed Clayface to bring himself back together again while increasing his power. You have to wonder if there was any MP40 being pumped into the sea around Gotham. This change to his powers allowed him to essentially asexually reproduce, leading to the creation of his daughter Annie. Annie was to act as a scout checking to make sure it was safe for Clayface to rear his head, and then return. However, 
Annie wandered off, lost her memory, and began to develop a personality of her own. Despite this apparent sentience, Clayface refuses to acknowledge her identity and is adamant that she must return to him, because at the end of the day, she was part of him, and her absence left a void within him. Imagine if your spleen got up and walked away one day. Sure, you could survive without it, but you'd really want to get it back if you could, right? Now, Annie can quite easily be read as a trans allegory, and it's made all the more painful by the fact that her father will not accept her identity or her right to exist. It's ironic that Clayface, a queer person himself, is unable to accept his daughter's identity and insists she must conform to his idea of who she is, namely, himself. While Robin does his best to free Annie from Clayface, she eventually sacrifices herself to save Robin from her father. The scene in which Annie is reabsorbed back into Clayface's body and effectively killed is harrowing and can be read as a metaphor for trans erasure. Once she is reabsorbed into Clayface, that's it for Annie. For all intents and purposes, she is dead, killed at the hands of her own father. I have to say, I didn't see Growing Pains until I was a teenager, and my God, the end of that episode felt like a real kick in the gut. But then what should you expect from a Clayface episode, right? Of course, these are just my opinions and how I've come to interpret these episodes over time. I was on Batman the Animated Podcast to talk about Mudslide a few years ago, and at the time, all the queer subtext in that episode went right over my head. But once it was pointed out to me, it became really obvious. I was curious as to if any of this subtext was intentional, so I reached out to Marv Wolfman, one of the writers of Feet of Clay, and Steve Perry, who wrote Mudslide, to ask about the queer subtext in their stories. I never heard back from Marv, but I got a nice response from Steve Perry, who talked a little about his recollections of making Mudslide. While Alan Burnett and I never discussed the queerness, and it was never written anywhere, that broadcasting standards and practices might see it and get agitated, I was given to understand that Matt, Clayface and Teddy exchanged some looks that hinted at a relationship, and that the notion seemed to be, ah, of course they're gay. Writers offer things. Readers or watchers bring their own sensibilities to it, and see stuff they want or need to see. Academics sometimes go down a road that is entirely wrong. I remember a John Lennon comment wherein someone was looking for deep meaning in something he'd written. Well, it rhymed with Queen, didn't it? Anything remotely sexual, straight, gay, or other had to be dialed down, because even though none of us thought of it as a children's show per se, that's where it was marketed and broadcasted, mostly after school. A lot of superhero stuff has adult context, but usually deep enough so children won't catch it, but adults, and sometimes the censors, will. So, based on what uh, Steve Perry told me, it seems like it wasn't necessarily intentional, but I think that at the end of the day, if we can see something in these stories, then it's there. If you can't see it, or don't think that it's there, then that's your truth. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Although in this case, I'm pretty sure the cigar is a phallus. <laughs>